Our next speaker is Dr. Ryan Brook. Ryan is an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan and oversees the Wild Boar Project. Ryan obtained his bachelor's in zoology, master's in natural resource management, and a PhD in environment and geography, all from the University of Manitoba. He then completed a PDF from the veterinary medicine in veterinary medicine at the University of Calgary. His research interests are in wildlife ecology and health, aboriginal community engagement, and traditional ecological knowledge, farmer knowledge about wildlife, youth engagement in science, and the management of the wildlife livestock interface. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Brooke join us today. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. I was listening to our previous speaker and I was thinking two things. This is unbelievable. And I thought, oh my God, I gotta follow this guy. <laughs> Would have been nice to have a heads up. By the way, Ryan, you're going after the greatest speaker on the planet. Uh, thanks for that, Jason, appreciate it. Uh, so I am not going to be able to match that, but I am also gonna follow up and give it my level best and talk about wild, invasive wild pigs Wild hogs, feral swine, you can call them what you like. Uh, we call them a pain in the ass where I come from. <laughs> but we're, we, uh, we do have a real struggle here. And I'm, I'm from Canada, so I'm going to talk mostly about our work in Canada. But to be clear, this is a global problem. They're, they are an issue anywhere you go. My, one of the great things about working at a university is you get a sabbatical where you get to go and travel and see things. And we, we picked up our family and moved for 13 months and traveled around the world to 17 different countries. And they all had, including traveling extensively through the US, all of those places had the exact, almost the exact same story to tell. These wild boar, wild pigs are a huge problem and they're really expanding out of control. I wanna acknowledge my uh, two graduate students, Ruth and Corey, who are cornerstone to this. If you wanna, wanna follow some of our work, uh, uh, we're on Facebook. We have a very active uh, Facebook page, and I'm on Twitter, and uh, follow us there if you want more information on our research. And to, certainly, this is a huge team effort. All of the work on pigs, uh, you know, we so, I sort of, when I was in the U.S., I worked a lot with the USDA folks, and when I was down in Fort Collins, Colorado, they'd have a meeting of all the, the whole wild pig team would meet regularly, and they had a huge room and 30 people on conference calls. When we have a wild pig research meeting in Canada, my two students come into the two chairs in my office and we have a chat over coffee about wild pigs. So we're a small bunch, but we're very lucky to work with local farmers who made this research possible. And at first we were sort of looking for permission, but we quickly realized we had some great partners on our hand when they would come out and help us with our work to find and remove pigs. And this group was actively involved in finding and removing feral swine and they actually paused everything for two years to allow our new research. And we agreed when we we're done, we'd go through together and remove all the pigs afterward and clean things up. And so this is us finishing up our work uh, collaboratively. So it's been a great program. And as I said, this is a global issue. So it's not just a US thing, it's not just a Canada thing. That whole black area all through Europe and Asia, that's their native range where they're called wild boar and a little bit into North Africa. All of the other areas are introduced. So Australia has so something north of 17 million. Uh, the continental US has probably more than 7 million wild pigs and all through Africa, uh, South America, and indeed most recently in Canada as well. It's been relatively recent, but again, major issues across the board. And so we use a bunch of bit different terms. None of them are particularly wrong. We often call them free-ranging wild pigs in Canada because we have some animals that have no wild boar genetics whatsoever. So it's a better sort of catch-all term. And you see both in the US and Canada, a whole range of colors. Some are jet black, some are sort of brown to gray. Um, and indeed in Canada, we have some free-ranging feral domestic pigs as well. So sometimes on the landscape, it's not a wild boar looking animal, it's a Yorkshire pig that looks like it just walked out of a barn, but might be three or four generations removed from being in a barn and living out in the wild. So we have this whole range. And more recently, as you'll see in your bottom left, we also have this whole issue of pot belly pigs, which is a whole, in some ways, a, a parallel, but really concerning story as well. This is mostly coming from the pet trade. People are buying little teacup pigs or mini pigs they can put in their purse and they can post photos on Instagram and say, wow, look at me and my little pig. And then all of a sudden it becomes a 160 pound 
animal and takes a big dump on their one bedroom apartment couch and they go, this is not for me. And if you go on social media all around North America, people are begging, please take this enormous pot belly pig that I can no longer keep. Uh, and unfortunately what people are doing is dumping them into the wild. And so this is more on the pet industry side, but of course these are all, uh, all Suscrope, all the same species. And as we know about all these different types of pigs, they're sort of a one, love the one you're lift with kind of species. And so these will all crossbreed and make all manner of hybrids. And certainly in Canada, if you look online, you can find any manner of these for sale for $300 cash, back up your pickup, and all of a sudden you've got various kinds of swine you can raise, whether you know what you're doing or not. And the one in the bottom right really illustrates that. These are uh, the front animals are sort of wild boar type, you know, long drawn out nose, longer legs, full thick coat of, of hair. But then we see a, a pure pink pig behind it and then spotted behind that. And these are all surely hybrids. Uh, we're sure of that. But again, they all interbreed and they all cause similar damage. Some of you folks will be familiar with this. The U.S. has been dealing with this for over 400 years. And so we've seen, you know, widespread pigs, especially across the south. But we started in this, it was really interesting because uh, the USDA in, invited me down to Alabama in 2004 and I had sort of just been dabbling in this and not sure if what was going to happen in Canada and they showed these maps and said, well, as you can see, pigs are tied to warm weather. As we all know, pigs will only live under warm conditions and we're not going to see established populations in the north. Uh, we just know that's not going to happen. And then I went up next and showed all the pictures of pigs in Canada. And they happen to be in the coldest parts of Canada where we have winters 40 below. And we've had 36 days straight where it's 30 below or colder nonstop. And everybody went, oh, wow, okay. So that really changed the face of a lot of our thinking around North America. And not only what's happening in Canada, but realizing that those northern states were really at significant risk as well. And so the story started a long time ago, many hundreds of years ago in the US, but in Canada only started in the 1980s. We don't have any native pigs uh, running free in Canada at all, and, but they were introduced, to, there was a big push through the 1980s and into the 90s to diversify agriculture. You just couldn't have you know, pigs and canola and wheat and barley, that was not enough. We had emu farms, somebody tried to farm moose, believe it or not. And we had all these diverse crops and all these different animals coming in to try and diversify agriculture, which sounded good and, and worked in some cases. And so European wild boar were brought over, including from Poland, including from primarily from the UK to be raised on farm to produce meat. Uh, but unfortunately they got out. They're very hard to keep inside a fence. They go over fences, under fences, through fences, and, uh, can, and really get into the wild relatively easily. Also, unfortunately, the market collapsed for the sale of these. It just ne we just never built the infrastructure. It just never took off enough. And so we really saw a dramatic crash. And so the price dropped. You could barely give them away. And so unfortunately, some producers just cut the fence and let them go. And this is what, uh, if you know a little bit about Canadian geography, this is all of Canada, all of our provinces. Um, and you can see the, this is the census data for 2001 showing that we had at the very peak, we had 500 farms with uh, 32,000 animals on farms across Canada, most of it in the western provinces. And the prairie provinces are those three in the center, that red arrow, keep in mind, that's an important one because the dark black spots were the high concentrations of where we had lots and lots of domestic wild boar farms. Now, this is important because you see that black square that the red arrow points to. I'm going to show you where the feral swine are. And there's actually more wild pigs in that one black square now than there are in the rest of Canada combined. So we know where they came from and we know the cause. Release and escape across and all the provinces at least dabbled in it. So this was quite a widespread uh, phenomenon. This is what we call a sounder group of pigs. Typically a mature female lead in the front and a whole bunch of her offspring, usually mostly female offspring of hers from previous generations. And you can't see in the shrubs here, but it would be very unlikely to see a sounder group of pigs without lots of young ones. And this is one of the things that characterizes invasive pigs, perhaps mostly in terms of their success, 
is this incredible reproductive rate. And, in, and we've actually enhanced it by when wild boar were introduced on farms, the experts said, well, if you want a longer pig, you want a bigger pig, you want larger offspring, more frequent offspring, cross them a domestic pig. And so Durek, Landrace, all sorts of other breeds were crossed with these wild boar. And so almost everything you will see inside a fence and running around in the wild in Canada is a hybrid. And unfortunately, we call them super pigs in some ways because these super pigs have added all the wonderful genetics that are built in domestic pigs and made them far worse. And so they have this uh, incredible reproductive rate and all of the other advantages that come with having domestic pig genetics. So this is called a sounder. Uh, we sometimes in Canada refer to it as a shit show of pigs because it is, <laughs> this is pretty alarming. Um, and I did a bit of, you guys may, uh, one thing I found, I grew up on a farm where we raised domestic pigs. And so after a while, you just look at it and you're like, your brain clicks 212 pounds, 214, okay, I can see that. You just get ridiculously good at estimating weights. I said, oh, I know what I'm doing here. I'll look at these and estimate weights. That doesn't apply. You have to relearn everything when you want to estimate a weight on these things. Totally different body, totally different distribution of body fat, and they're mostly muscle with a whole bunch of gristle holding it together. And, uh, but I did do some estimates, and I figured that this particular group weighs about the same as an F-150 pickup truck. And so four days ago, I was actually up in the Arctic, and I was poking around in uh, grizzly bear dens, this is another part of my research, and my dad, the farmer, was quite concerned about my safety, and I said, I would take a grizzly bear on any day compared to this group. These things can be extremely aggressive. They have very large, razor-sharp tusks, and when you're holding these animals down, you see those two tusks touching each other, and they never stop moving. They're just sharpening, sharpening, sharpening. And we actually had one of our group was holding a, we were holding the pig down, and she went around to get to the other side, but got too close. And they just lift their head like that, and they get you on the inside of the leg. And her whole leg was cut open. Luckily, it was minus, it was about 35 below, and she had seven pairs of pants on, which uh, saved the day. But they can be extremely aggressive, and we've seen that. We've seen them charge us, and we've definitely had some, some moments where you realize that's what the spare pair of underwear in your pocket is for. <laughs> uh, re reproductive rates are nowhere near as much as you're going to see from, from any one of you folks. If you saw this on your farm, you might be a little alarmed, but ecologically, six young per litter. and. And one of the things we thought was, because Canada is so seasonal, so we have reasonably warm temperatures, we'll get, you know, we'll get into the 80s and 90s in the summer, but we have this long period of snow from November until March. And again, temperatures dropping into not always 40 below, but certainly 30 below is constant uh, through much of the winter, said, well, they're going to be seasonal. Well, in fact, most of these pigs, given enough size, and given enough access to agricultural food, which unfortunately there is a lot of, most of these mature females are having two litters per year. So we're seeing tremendous reproduction. And the other thing is that they're continuously reprodu reproducing as well. So our elk, our deer, our moose, caribou, all of these other ungulates, they're giving birth in a two week window in the spring. Very predictable. Elk will have one at most. Moose, I saw one time I saw a moose with five and was blown away. That was almost certainly some adoption going on there. So five is a, almost unheard of for moose, but yet six is the average for these. So the reproductive rate is far, you know, 12 young per litter, or pardon me, per year from female with two litters, far exceeds anything we're seeing in nature by a major factor. And we're seeing from our trail camera work, we also know we're seeing young newborn piglets at heel uh, in all seasons. Not so much in late winter, but definitely across all seasons, which is quite alarming. This is a relatively small Canadian pig. No, this is a good size one. I'm kidding. They're not all this big, but certainly this is a good size one. But hunters no longer, it used to be bragging rights if you had a 400 pound pig, that would be front page news in the local paper, man poses with wild pig. Uh, now 400 isn't necessarily bragging rights. The biggest animal we've handled that we captured with a helicopter was a, a, a bred female, 638 pounds. So that crossbreeding, bringing in some of those domestic breeds means they get big. And one of the rules in ecology, we call it Bergman's rule, it says of any species, as you go north, animals get bigger because there is a tremendous advantage. If you're living in 40 below, 
you're going to do a lot better if you're bigger. And I realize that I'm a living example of that, but um, <laughs> not all Canadians are this big, but we do better when we're larger. And so uh, these, unfortunately, there's a really, uh, well, there are folks looking for trophy animals. Uh, being really large means you're going to do well. So there is quite a strong selection for that. So we get really big animals. And so as our research, one of the things we started, and, and this was long before anybody was really talking about pigs in Canada or doing much about it, we started collecting sightings and occurrences using trail cameras, talking to egg extension people, all of these things. And of course, searching the media, because anybody at that time who saw a pig, it literally was front page news. Uh, somebody saw one, it was right away reported. And so we've been documenting this. Uh, basically, the first one that we are aware of in Canada occurred in 1995. So this is sort of the scale of how these pigs can expand. This is a bit of an experiment, if you will. We took a massive country, one of the largest in the world, put a few farms across it, had some releases and escapes, and they've absolutely exploded from there, which is exactly what pigs do. Uh, Chris Rock, the comedian, has this great bit that I always laugh at. He talks about in Vegas, the, the lion trainers are training their lions, and one of the lions attacked him. And everybody said the lion went crazy. And Chris Rock's bit is he said, the lion didn't go crazy, the lion went lion. The lion did exactly what lions do, and so we shouldn't be you know, surprised by this. Well, wild pigs go pig, and they expand, and they reproduce, and they spread. And so we found a handful of occurrences in 95, and 96, 97, 2, 3, 2001, we had none. Our entire database is empty of occurrences from 2001. In 2022, they now occupy over 350,000 square miles in Canada. So that is just truly, I mean, you can be frustrated with, you can despise them, but at some level you have to respect their overall success. It's truly remarkable. Um, and so in our group, in our, our program, we get, in the last five years, we get 4.4 new wild pig occurrences every single day over the last five years. And we know we're not getting all of them. Not everybody wants to say, hey, Ryan, this is my best fishing hole, and oh, but this is my favorite spot to hunt pigs. And so we know we're missing quite a bit, but we have over 60,000 unique occurrences in our database so far, and probably by the time I'm done this uh, presentation, there'll probably be a few more on my phone. 58% uh, were in the last five years, so I think with COVID, and you know, everybody knows what an exponential curve looks like now, and this is exactly what we see. This is exactly what we should expect anywhere. You take pigs and drop them anywhere. You see them hang on a little bit, and then they just take off, and the line points towards the sky. And this is, of course, what happens in the absence of serious control, to, or control efforts. 99.4% are on the Canadian prairie. So Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, that center west area. It's also the coldest winters in the province. So some of the thinking and assumptions we had about pigs were thrown it out the window. And what they do, which is pretty interesting, is they actually build what we call pigloos. And they actually tunnel into the snow. And so, at the, and you measure it, the snow temperature right at the very surface might be 38 below. The temperature three feet under the snow is about 35, 32. And in fact, one of the ways we find them in, in Canada is we'll get a really crazy pilot that will fly very first thing in the morning at 40 below. And you can actually see the steam pouring out of these. You have 1,800 pounds of wild pig jammed into a snow cave. That's a lot of moisture. And the steam is pouring out. You, get, that's, you can't see the pigs. You can't see the snow, Dan. But you can see the steam pouring out the top. So one of the things we've sort of spearheaded in Canada is capturing with helicopter. We cover such huge areas. Um, ground trapping can work. We've had some challenges with ground trapping. There are different ways to do it. But given the large areas, you can see the orange net there that we've shot over top, or hopefully you can see the net on that front pig that's being restrained. And so we <laughs> step out and we take the first thing we do, which is crazy, is you take the door off your helicopter at 30 below and leave it somewhere and hopefully don't lose it. We've lost our door a few times. <laughs> it's scratching our head, okay, who remembers where we set that? And it's, of course, trees as far as you can see, right? And where the heck do we leave that damn? And of course, so with these things, the door is like $17,000. It's not like just go to Home Depot and buy a new one. So these, these pigs, you can capture them. It's really effective. It's good for a few things. One of the things that we do 
is, uh, is what we call a Judas pig technique. Capture a pig, put a GPS collar on it, remove the rest. We, ca we capture, hold them down, and just use a penetrating bolt gun and, and put them away. Um, but we can leave one alive and put it with a GPS collar. And so we use helicopters. Usually we have two to three airplanes in the air and five to ten people on the ground. We've tried every technique there is, but the best way to find wild pigs is to follow another wild pig. So we capture, if it's a, a big male especially, they have these huge home ranges. And because they're reproducing all the time, all the males do essentially is go through this huge area from sounder group to sounder group and just servicing any available females. They might stay with them for a few days, do what they need to do, move on to the next, and continuously do that year round. So they're the perfect Judas pig. So we give it a vasectomy, put a collar on it, and let it go. So it's not going to spread its genes because one of the big challenges, and this is a fair criticism, people said, okay, Ryan, let, let's get this straight. You captured a wild pig, and then you let it go back onto my farm area? They say, yes, but we got a collar. Yes, we're going to take it out, but we're going to use it to find others, and no, it will not reproduce. So that's the best compromise we came up with. And the problem is that most of the times you don't see them. That's the real challenge. And, you know, in, in all of our, you know, in Iowa, I'm sure they do the same thing. Government flies lines back and forth. And I've spent a couple thousand hours of my life in a little tiny plane going back and forth counting animals, deer, elk, moose, whatever you have. It doesn't work for pigs because they're rarely above ground or certainly during the day. And so there's actually a, a GPS collared female with eight young in here, but you can't see them. In this case, they're actually buried under the soil and vegetation and they're completely invisible. Luckily, you can track it with a collar wherever it goes. So it's a tremendously successful approach. And so this is a bit of a story of what happened in Canada. Um, you know, 1990 to 2000, those little red blips are what we know of for wild pig occurrences. In order to be comparable with the work that the USDA is doing, we chose also to use watersheds, which makes sense for pigs because they are tied to water and wetlands a lot. And these aren't arbitrary like county boundaries. These are ecologically significant. So each little red blob represents the presence of a pig from 1990 to 2000. So I, you can see why nobody really wanted to hear too much about it at that point. It wasn't a big deal, but it is equivalent, if, you, if you'll allow me, it's somewhat similar to a fire in your house. You don't call 911 and say, 911 and say, oh my God, I've got a house fire. They don't say, well, it's only in the kitchen. Call me back tomorrow when it reaches the basement. This is like having a, a, a little tiny fire. <laughs> it can turn into an awful big one really fast. And I think that analogy is appropriate, if, especially in Canada, where we get these huge out of control wildfires. Um, the reason we use a watershed this size is this is almost exactly the size of a home range. So if you map out all the movements over a year from a collared animal, they look about that big. Some of the big males are bigger, but that, that gives us a good approximation. By 2010, when we really got serious about pigs, you could see again those three prairie provinces in the, in the left center there uh, starting to be a concern. A few more moving into the, uh, British Columbia on the far left, but really the prairie provinces were quite concerning. And then by 2017, when my PhD student Ruth uh, completed this part of the data collection and we published this paper, you could see Saskatchewan, we say it's hard to pronounce, but it's easy to draw. It's, uh, you can see in the middle, it's the squarest of the provinces. And so by then, we're starting, this doesn't mean we're overwhelmed by them by any means. And one of the real challenges, I will say, in all of this through my career, is it has felt an awful lot like studying Sasquatch, because I'm saying, wild pigs, we've got to be concerned. And people say, I've lived here 60 years of my life. I've never seen a pig, and none of my neighbors have seen a pig. Ryan, we don't know what the heck you're talking about. I said, honestly, really, here's a picture of one. I've seen them. And so it's been a, probably arguably still is the single biggest challenge is trying to convince people this is a huge deal and we need to get serious about it when nobody's seeing them. So it is a bit of a case of out of sight, out of mind. And it has continued to get worse. And so this is the most updated map I made just before I came here. This is all of the three prairie provinces combined because, of course, Pigs don't respect provincial boundaries. They don't pr respect uh, international boundaries either. And so the red is all the places we found occurrences across all the watersheds. And blue is where we have confirmed reproduction, mostly from trail cameras. Trail cameras have revolutionized our research in that regard. 
And so you can see we've got well-established populations over a pretty big area. And unfortunately, despite uh, this is perhaps a bit controversial and some may disagree, but I will say firmly that we have absolutely missed the window of eradication. Some people are clinging to it, but I will be so bold as to say, if you think eradication in Canada is possible at this point, you do not understand the situation. Somebody, if I was in Canada, I might get a few chairs thrown at me for that one, so I was ready to dodge. But uh, it is a bit controversial, but as, as an expert on this, I'm gonna say that. Uh, particularly important to US folks is look at where they all, of course, that southern line isn't some random line. That's the Canada-US border. And so one of the very real and very important concerns that US folks have raised and, and continue to raise, and I will be so bold as to say, one of several reasons why I accepted this invitation is to highlight exactly this, because I think that Canada has been dragging their feet on this, and frankly, it's pretty embarrassing to talk about this over and over internationally when we failed quite badly at dealing with this. So it is a bit of an embarrassment to have to talk about this, but I'm hoping one of the ways that may change is I'm encouraging as much as I can uh, for US folks to exert pressure on Canada and say, especially in the context of African swine fever, this is a real concern. This map should make everybody nervous. Um, because of course, where you are in Iowa here, you've got some hogs that have been trapped for a number of years, I understand, in the southern part of the state. There's sort of been a challenge from the south. But now, under this circumstance, we have across US, we have concerns of pigs moving south. And some of my colleagues in the USDA say there's two, way, two ways pigs move, wild pigs move. One is running at about 30 miles an hour. And the other is in the back, uh, back of a pick truck, pickup truck at 70 miles an hour. And so those are the two ways they get moved around. And so the concern of them moving north, but now my key point today is that we have a real concern of them coming down from the north as well. And this shows you all of those points mapped out. And in some ways, I think we could say, not unlike the US in some ways, but I, I often say that Canada has a two pig problem in the sense that we have this widespread distribution of occurrences across a massive area. You know, this is a few hundred thousand square miles. This isn't just a little area where we can put a few traps and, and you know, get a few people with high powered rifles and clean this up. This is a massive area and continuing to expand at you know, more than certainly easy, easily 40,000 square miles per year. So we have this two pig problem. We have all these widespread individuals but in those three circles, we also have these what I call strongholds of wild pigs, where we have lots of them. And that one in the middle, there's more wild pigs in that central yellow circle than there is in the rest of Canada combined. So it is very much of those, should I fish or cut bait? Fish or cut bait? Well, you have to do both. You have to be addressing that one point there, actually in the Rocky Mountains, that threatens our tourism industry, potentially and those circles of high concentration. You can't do one or the other, you have to do both. The big issue, of course, for us in this room, and I think the reason, I, uh, primary reason I was asked to talk, come and talk was about that we're seeing this. We're seeing wild pigs hopping the fence, and this is a bizarre situation. We were driving along uh, rural Saskatchewan, we actually had a helicopter up and we were racing to the site, and all of a sudden I jammed on the brakes and slid sideways down the road, and I said, is that a wild pig in there? And so we went up to the farm and knocked on the door and I asked him about it. I said, did you buy a wild boar uh, from a farmer? He said, no, he just hopped the fence and moved in. It was great. <laughs> and <coughs> he said, I was short a boar anyway, so this is excellent. Because that, that spring, of course, wild, wild pigs have their, their young, have these horizontal cream colored stripes for camouflage. Well, every piglet born on that farm had cream colored stripes. And, a lot of brown hair. Uh, I don't know how that young guy made it work with that big sow, but he, he was very effective and he got it done. And then, so I'm standing there talking to this guy and I'm really, now we're well outside of the zone of reality here. This is bizarro world. And so I start offering cash, not because I want a wild pig, but because I want to bolt gun it and bury it and call it a day. Because not only is this a bad situation of a disease side, this is very, very bad optics. You do not want people, well, you don't want people showing pictures like this around from Canada. That would be terrible, right? Well, this, this is a terrible scenario that, uh, this is the one I get beat up on most. And I think in some ways people say, don't show this. And I say, 
too damn ass bad. I'm a tenured professor. I get to say what I <laughs> get to say whatever I damn ass hell want. <laughs> and so I say, and of course I don't say this. You know, I don't portray this as saying, oh, this, you know, this evil operation or these bad guys doing bad things, but saying. We need to fix this. I think we can all agree that this is arguably the worst case scenario, and we've seen several around. And so obviously that's a part of the problem is the level of contact. And so one of the things we've done with our GPS callers is looked at, we've mapped at very broad scales where pigs overlap with domestic pigs and extremely fine scales and showing actually individual GPS collared pigs going, <coughs> pardon me, onto individual farms. And so this is the overall, this is that same map I'm showing you. These are the watersheds that have pigs, and the darker the color, the more domestic pig farms there are. So uh, Manitoba on the far right has a lot of uh, pig farms in the south, and a growing number of, of invasive wild pigs. So this is not a small problem. It does highlight some areas where we'd want to, if you have some money to invest in protection and, and biosecurity, this is where, you know, I could definitely highlight where it should be. But this is a very widespread concern. And this figure, by the way, was built uh, pre-African swine fever. Now it has infinitely more concern and impact when we know. And, and um, I, for the purposes of time, I'm not going to dig all into the GPS collar data. But the other thing we found is that these GPS collar pigs are visiting some swine barns two to three times a day, uh, picking up you know, the auger is sitting there and there's some spilled grain or they climb into the, the auger bin or truck spills a bit of feed hair or of course they're attracted. What's more attractive to, the only thing arguably more attractive to a male wild pig on the landscape than corn is a sow barn. The smells emanating out of there presumably are like heaven to these big males and draw them right in and so we see males coming in looking for love as well as food. And so I, I won't speak too much to ASF today, but want to note that it does create a unique problem. And I would argue, from my personal perspective, is that Canada has made massive strides dealing with ASF and doing lots and lots of good. And every, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be a domestic swine expert, ironically. Uh, you guys brought me up here to talk in front of you, and I'll say I'm not a domestic swine expert, but I grew up on a hog farm and know a little bit about things. And, and I think that's going well, but I think one of the big gaps we have here in Canada is that we know wild pigs can get ASF, we know they can spread ASF, and of course they're around. And so if any kind of contaminated food ended up in the landscape, that would be a problem. And as some of you may know, entire countries have literally put up a fence to keep a wild boar from other countries coming in on them. And so what I'm hoping will not come from this meeting is that uh, U.S. is building a border wall and Canada is going to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not planting a seed or an idea because frankly I don't think this is the best use of your dollars. I agree we need to do lots of things. But I think that this is a sign of how significant and how concerned we are about their movements. So the obvious question, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this slide, what do we do? Uh, the U.S. is, is, you know, they're the experts. We have tons and tons of folks we've worked with in the U.S. about how to trap them. That's not the only tool. You need, one of the things I always talk about with whether it's wolves or cougars or wild pigs is that you need a toolbox approach with these complex problems. There's no one solution, no magic bullet that's going to say, ah, the one thing fixed the problem that is not happening. Trapping, you can capture and remove entire sounders at one time. You've got your smartphone hooked up to the trap. You're, you know you've got 14 pigs in the area. You're, the triggers, your phone goes off at 3 o'clock in the morning. You go, wow, somebody's at the trap. You count them walking in, 11, 12, 13, 14. You hit the magic button on your phone, and the whole trap, trap drops, and you've got all of them at once. That is the ideal scenario. We talked about Judas pigs. That's really important, especially when you've got these big males wandering over huge areas. They're much more harder to trap. A lot of discussion in the U.S. right now trying to get poison approved. This is a nitrite-based poison. The big challenge with any poison is getting it to the pigs and not anything else. And also, of course, getting enough to all of the pigs. This may surprise you, but if given the opportunity, one pig will take all of the food. Um, and so that can be a problem. This, this group may not be totally shocked by that. But um, unfortunately, the, the other key message here is that hunting is not the solution because it makes sense. If you've got 15 pigs, 
and you and your buddies go out and shoot half of them tomorrow, well, we've just eliminated 50%. The problem with hunting is a few things. One, it makes them much more, anything that survives is much more elusive and they immediately become almost completely nocturnal and difficult to find. It also breaks up in scatters groups. So you find a group of 10, you shoot five, you think, wow, we got 50%. But those five that survived, they broke up. One ran 30 miles this way, one ran 20 miles that way. And so now you've got new groups. And so congratulations, you just pissed off all your neighbors because you just moved the problem 10 miles down the road. So uh, despite the, at, at first glance, you think that this would be the option, but in fact, where we have any success at all is where you eliminate hunting and then go in with traps and other, these other things. What can producers do? Biosecurity is your, you know, I, I think the key thing. I teach a third year course uh, at my university called Animals, Agriculture and the Environment, and it's all about animals and how they interact. And, and sort of the running joke in my class, which isn't a joke really, is that you know almost any question I will ever ask you on exam, two good answers are fencing and education. That will often help with a lot of problems. And so, so perimeter fencing is something that, to think about. Um, learning about the issue, of course, and learning what to do. Um, and also squealing on pigs. So I was gonna wear my squeal on pigs t-shirt today, and I forgot to, but the US and Canada both have jumped on this squeal on pigs program, where if you see a pig, you don't grab your AR-15 and go chasing after it, you call the pros. Just like if you're, you have a house on fire, a barn on fire, you don't grab your garden hose and go after it. You call the pros and they come in and do it. And I think that's a really good example where um, I know even my, farmer father who would never allow a handyman on his farm in his life and would fix everything himself. I still convinced him, if you see a pig, call the experts in. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on uh, is what we call on-farm risk assessments, where we set up a questionnaire and you know, look at the habitat around you, which is a factor. You can't do anything about that necessarily. But also, how are you feeding animals? Where are you feeding? You know, is this a, you know, we have probably about half of our farms in Canada are large commercial operations and the other half are backyard operations, which may or may not have much, if any, good biosecurity. Um, and I just say, you know, one of the things easy you can do is just buy a couple of trail cameras, put them around, especially where there's feed or some other attractant, and just let them run and look at them whenever you can. That's just another way of sort of spotting for pigs to report them. So I really want to thank everybody for their time today, especially after our previous speaker set us up so well. You know, in some ways, I think I'm going to hire him to tour around with me and get everybody jazzed up and excited because that was a <laughs> really wonderful message, especially when mine is a, can be a bit of a downer. But I think, you know, I think there's a lot of good hope and I think things have changed a lot in the last two years in Canada. So we're, I think things are looking a lot more positive. One of the things I often say at meetings, which also wins me friends and influences people, is I say, meetings don't eradicate wild pigs. <laughs> and uh, I say that in some very much truth, that meetings, of course, are important. But I've said that, you know, every time you have a meeting, you have to arrive with seven pigs in your pickup truck. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not allowed in, because we need to do more than just talk about this. Um, I want to thank very much for the invitation. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, in fact, and, and perhaps all of the story that I just told can probably be summed up by saying that virtually all of the research that I've done in Canada has been funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We've had some initial seed money and support, but the overwhelming majority of this is actually funded by the USDA, so I'm grateful to them. But it also probably tells you an awful lot about how things are going in Canada, that we have exactly three researchers and all of it is funded by the USDA. So thank you so much, everybody. We may have time for a question or two. How are we for time? Yeah, one, one question. Okay. All right, we have time. Let's take one quick question. And I see it right back here. We'll go with the Kevin. president of IPPA. To Hi, Kevin. Off. How are we doing, Ryan? Good, good. Um, do wild pigs have any predators? Wild pigs do have predators in their natural range. So in Italy, wolves take a lot. In some areas, bears will. I've seen photos, I, amazing trail camera photo from Florida, where you see a half a pig running across the screen and a cougar in full stretch and reaching out just about to grab it. Uh, so cougars will take them as well. Uh, the problem we have in Canada is that in most of the ag areas, we did a really good job 100 years ago of getting rid of all our top predators. So in most of the range we see in Canada right now, 
the biggest predator you'll see is a coyote. And a coyote, I don't think, even a group of coyotes, is not going to mess with a 638-pound sow with uh, steak knives on her face. <laughs> so uh, what is one thing we're starting, I'm looking for a PhD student right now to look at them moving north into the boreal forest. And we think once they move away from agriculture, they're probably not going to do well because to survive the cold, you need to be, and this happened, one of our producers was, uh, um, I don't know if you use them much down here, but we use uh, grain bags. It looks like a great big glad garbage bag, but you put your grain in the field, and then the spring you get it out. Well, he put his auger in and was bringing it down this spring, and all of a sudden got to a certain level, and this 500-pound male stood up and been living in his barley pile all winter and getting quite large and happy, and away he walked. So we have this big, huge egg subsidy for pigs, and we have no predators, so it's a perfect environment. What happens when they move into areas, you know, like in the Rocky Mountains where you have grizzlies, maybe. But Montana said, well, yeah, we have grizzlies. And I said, what's your biggest grizzly? 430 pounds. I said, our biggest one is 638 pounds. I'm worried about your grizzlies, not my pigs. <laughs> so so I, I, I don't know. I, my view is that I, as much as it would be great, I don't think predation is going to help here. Daryl had a question. What kind of fence do you need uh, to keep a feral pig? You build a perimeter fence around the world. Yeah, uh, per, uh, uh, fence to keep pigs out. That's a great question. You need something that obviously goes, you know, four feet underground, and ideally at least six feet above ground. If I was building a fence, I've seen a pig go up and over a six-foot fence, so I'd have six foot plus on top um, to keep them out. Certainly electric. I, if it was my farm and I was building, I'd build a, a barrier fence at least six feet high and have a, a couple of strands of electric on top of that, for sure. It can be a real challenge. If they want to get somewhere, it can be incredibly hard to stop them. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, everybody.